Okay, uh, for this next increment, I'm switching to the English so that you can get a better sense of the funky wordplay. Our passage is 189 syllables in the Greek and is that much text from verse 29 to the end of verse 31. And what we're doing really is sort of like testing the meter that we got for its fit to the text because if it's not fitting to the text really well then the meter's probably wrong that's what we're testing here because the purpose of meter in the bible is to elucidate the text elucidate with respect to what dates written elucidate with respect to what other bible verses are supposed to be folded in elucidate with respect to the meaning of the doctrine underneath the text elucidate with respect to the whole date line of bible which is an essential part of scripture now all of this the scholars don't know. I can't wait for them to find out. I'm going to be dead before they find out. So I'm doing this now. Now this particular thing is not mine. It's anomenon, ano, anonin, nomenon material. He did the meter for Matthew 24, so we're vetting it. I've done meter on other things which you can find mostly in Vimeo, in my Vimeo channels. But the methodology is the same. That's why we're doing this now. So now we're in the third paragraph of, as it were, trends for the church age. In addition to the, you know, obvious meaning here, which is Second Advent, literal. Why would this be, and how would it be um, metaphorical for the church age, this text in verses 29 through 31? That's what's at issue here. And your key is basically by looking at the text, of course. Immediately, this is utus. It means next. Next in sequence. Okay? Tribulation is our word thlipsis, and there's regular tribulation and the official tribulation, of course. And then he's quoting, and do I, can I show it here? Yeah. Let me bring it up. Let me, come on, baby. Come on, tell me your work. There we go. Okay. You can see in the lower window, this is um, BibleWorks' own cross-referencing system. In the NASB version, this is why I like to use it in videos, in the NASB version, when scripture is quoted, they render it in caps. And if you look in the bottom window, you'll see, okay, that it's telling you related verses. Okay. Right now I've got my cursor on the word sun, but it's the whole passage, okay? And you'll see in the lower window it's in Isaiah. There are lots of references to this sun being darkened and moon not giving its light and stars falling, okay? Now one of the things that they don't mention about the stars falling that they should have mentioned um, is Revelation 12, which is the vision of the woman and Satan having the argument and falling out of heaven when he's at mid-trip. That has a lot to do with this. And John will be referencing this particular passage of stars falling in there um, in Revelation 12. So that's where you get your clue. Okay, we have all of scripture. At the time he was talking, he was talking based on scripture that was already there. So technically speaking, if you want to know what he was referring to, in the lower window, you don't look at anything beyond Matthew. Anything beyond Matthew is really talking back to Christ's quote here in Matthew 24. And that makes it significant, of course. But when he's talking, he's talking about passages already written prior to when he talks. Because he expects his audience to immediately understand what he's talking about. What is he talking about? Well some of the passages that he's talking about are not also listed down there. Um, he's talking about Zechariah 4, Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14 in particular. Zechariah 14 is the day of the Lord when the Lord comes back and he splits the Mount of Olives. There's a great earthquake and Jerusalem ends up becoming a seaport. You know, the whole prophecy there in Zechariah 14. Um, so this is a second advent, literal passage and he comes back on a day that's not night and I want to say he just hit me with Zechariah 14 7 so go look at that 
Um, so you want to look at those ideas as the first literal tribulational meaning of this passage, verses 9, 29 through 31. So now that you first get the literal, eventual meaning of the passage, then you have to step back and say, okay, but this is church. We're learning it and being told it now. How are we to use these verses now? Because all of Scripture is applicable now. It's just a question of finding out from God how. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. And he's giving us a clue about how to use it, what kind of doctrinal meaning value it has for us. Because the syllable count from 29 to 31 is 189. 189 is 168 plus 21, which means 84 plus 84 plus 21. So then the 21 is the metaphor that originally started, the numerical metaphor that God started to use as a growth number because that was the period of time that Jacob was under Laban. Okay, 21 years, a total of 21 years until God called him back to the land. All right, so God sent Jacob out to get a wife when he was 40. And then in his 61st year, when uh, Joseph is about six, possibly seven years old already at that point, that's when God orders um, Jacob to come back to the land. All right, so 21 comes to mean a growth number because when he comes back to the land, of course, he's got two families, a whole bunch of sons, a whole bunch of sheep, and all that other stuff because Laban kept cheating him. So God, you know, kept growing the sheep that were Jacob's and not growing the sheep that were Laban, you know, that stupid speckled thing. And so Jacob comes out much bigger, but he comes out in his own exodus away from Laban into the land under pressure, okay? Growth occurring under pressure, 21, evocative of Jacob coming back to the land. All right, that's what we're supposed to understand. The 284s, of course, mean that it still has to do with Christ. It still has to do with the temple. It still has to do with the temple the temple depicts. Okay? And our date line, therefore, for church is immediately after the tribulation of those days, meaning when the, when the temple falls. When the temple falls. When the temple falls, okay, but which temple? The temple meaning Christ at his execution in 30 A.D. Or the temple that falls in 70 A.D.? Well, you could argue it both ways. Because when he was on the cross, the sun was darkened. And the moon did not give its light. It was dark. And saying that stars fall from the sky has to do with the angelic conflict. Okay, just like it does in, in Revelation 12. Okay, and believers are called stars, sons of God. Two, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Again, this is the angelic conflict. Christ on the cross, Psalm 110, whole theme of the book of Hebrews. Christ on the cross went through tribulation. That was his personal tribulation. Okay, that caused Satan to be defeated. That's the theme of the book of Hebrews and the theme of Psalm 110. Now, being on the cross, you could say the sun of our hearts was darkened. He was darkened. The moon not giving off his light. That literally happened while he was on the cross in those three hours. And then, you know, the, the conflict with the angels, the stars falling, Satan in particular. And that will be, again, a very literal thing in Revelation 12. And the powers of the heavens shaken. Yeah, because he's winning a strategic victory on the cross. That's Psalm 110. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is explaining. That's why there's a change of covenant to church. That the covenant upgraded as a result of his death on the cross. We don't go back to the Mosaic Law because the Mosaic Law was fulfilled by Christ. That's Romans 10, 4. Okay? See how pithy this is in its application to church? But it doesn't seem like it on the surface, does it? Tribulation of those days. Which kind of tribulation? The tribulation of Christ on the cross? Well, just explain what those meanings are. And in part, you know, you could keep talking about it forever. Okay, then the second meaning is, well, what about the fall of the actual physical temple? Okay, the fall of the actual physical temple was burning. Okay, well, if you're seeing the burning, then there's all that smoke covering up the sun. The moon wouldn't be giving up its light. It's still burning at, at night. 
So it's the burning that you see, but you don't see the sun and you don't see the moon. And the stars, those would be the stars of Jacob, the sons of Israel, falling. Okay? And you could say that they're falling from the sky as a sort of metaphysical thing. And then the powers of the heavens would be shaken again because, you know, Israel's going down. Now, this particular set of wording right in here is very common to Greek literature. The whole basis of Greek literature, because see, you know, the Bible isn't just for the Jews. The Bible's for Jews and Gentiles. The idea is you believe in Christ. In the Old Testament, that made you a Jew when you did that. In the New Testament, you're just a Christian when you do that. And a Jew can believe in Christ, or a Christian can believe, and a, a non-Jew can believe in Christ. Okay, so the Bible is written in terms that are going to be understandable to non-Jews. Okay, in all of your pagan literature, especially Greek literature, this kind of stuff was the very common wording. Okay, and the idea in all Greek literature is that whatever happens on earth is depicting something happening in heaven. The powers on heaven of heaven are shaken, therefore junk is happening on earth, and stars falling to the sky, and the moon not giving its life. Ooh, I, ooh, I, ooh, I, okay. That's a very common theme in Greek literature. All right, it was also, of course, first, you could argue first, in Isaiah. Or even, well, yeah, Isaiah precedes uh, Zechariah, because it's primarily in Isaiah and Zechariah. You see that? So when the temple falls, it's Israel's falling. Ooh, I, ooh, I, the sun is dark and the moon is not giving its light. The stars of the sons of Jacob are falling from the sky. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. You know, it's all that dramatic language that was very typical Greek drama. Okay, but it would be true and was true when the temple fell. So that's still applicable to the temple. So we got two kinds of tribulation before we even talk about church. Christ on the cross and the temple falling in 70 AD. So when he says, next after the tribulation of those days, that's very clever wording. And he's translating, you know, the translation is accurate for the Greek. Except that this is utis and it really means next. Okay, it means that there's no intervening event. Immediately doesn't necessarily mean immediate, like in quickly. It's just next. You don't know when it's going to happen. Okay, next after he went to the cross. Next after the tribute, after the temple falls. Okay? And that's what happened while he was on the cross. That did happen next in, in the sense of, sense of him being nailed to the cross first. And then while he's on the cross, it happens next. Sense of the, the temple falling down. While it's falling down, the sun is darkened because it's burning and all that smoke is in the way. As you see in the sun. You get the point? It's very clever wording. Okay, so then there's the third. There's actually a total of four. There's the third tribulation, which is the church time. Okay? It's just as important because temple, body, Christ, we are the body of Christ being built as a temple. Ephesians 2, two walls. All right? So when we're going through our own crosses, we're going through our own, um, what do you want to call it, fall. You know, because on any given day, you're either pro-God or against Him. If you're in the Spirit, you're pro-God, and the minute you sin, you're against Him. And all of your pro-lifers are anti-Christ, every single one of them. Every single one of them spits on Bible. You cannot be a pro-lifer and be in the Spirit at the same time. It's an anti-Bible position. I've proven that a number of times now in my pro-life blasphemy series. So then, the body of Christ, the sun is darkened and the moon's not giving its light because the stars of the Son of God have fallen. Mighty, mighty are the fallen. How fallen are the mighty when David, you know, cried when Saul fell. There's no joy in Mudville because Casey has struck out. More modern version. The mighty, the so-called Christians who are on television, who are busy telling you how pro-life they are, running for president or being a so-called pastor. All of them spitting on Christ while they talk. 
Isn't that the sun darkening? These guys are supposed to be the enlightenment for our society. And they sure are dark. These guys are supposed to be the light at the at, during the night. And look how dark they are. All of those disgusting, vile, lying antichrists on TBN. You know, Pat Robertson, Oral Roberts, James Dobson. Ted Cruz is one of the most vile anti-Christians on the planet. But everybody supports him. All the evangelicals are. Liberty University, Jerry Falwell, Coral Ridge, you name it. If they're famous in Christianity, they're apostate. If they're famous in Christianity, they're pro-life. If they're pro-life, they're spitting on the Bible. Because the Bible says only God makes you at birth. How come they don't know that? So how dark is the sun then? The sons of our society are darkened. The ones who are supposed to give us light at night are themselves darker than, than dark. So how the stars of the sons of God have fallen from the sky. In other words, you were, you're born as a citizen of heaven, but you're ejecting your polytuma privilege. You're ejecting your kingship rights to learn. You're spitting on Christ. You're spitting on Bible. You're drooling after Caesar. So then the sun is darkened. The moon isn't giving its light. Even Shakespeare understood these concepts I'm saying right now. Because that's how he words things. He plays on this whole passage. In other words, your luminaries of your society are apostate. Well, there you go. Under the tribulation of the court of public opinion. Under the tribulation of of false Christs under the tribulation of wanting to fit in with your fellow man. Okay? And look at this. See that picture? See right over here? Here's the cross. And here's the Star of David that it's some kind of natural way that the light is hitting the cross in the picture. So you got a Star of David at the right hand. Isn't that cute? Somebody took that picture. I don't know where I got it from. But I use it in my, you know, Who's he what's this for that reason? Okay, so now, the light of Christ is darkened. The moon, the luminaries of our society, even at night, don't give any light. They're so dark. The stars of our society who are supposed to be our pastors, our teachers, our presidents, they all fall. And they fell from the sky where they belonged. But like Satan, they rejected God by being pro-life, which is the most disgusting Antichrist Revelation 17 harlot position you can be. And the actual movement that Ted Cruz belongs to calls itself the Seven Mountains, which is Revelation 17. What does that tell you about how he cannot read the Bible? How he spits on Christ. The guy's my own senator. He's right here in town in Houston right now as I talk. And I'm hoping that God, the man, gets de-elected. powers of the heavens shaken. Yeah, they can be shaken because the bad guys are being shaken out or they can be shaken because the good guys are being shaken out. The same thing happened when Christ died on the cross. The same thing happened when the temple went down. All the luminaries of society in those days, they scattered. The shepherd was struck and the sheep scattered. The temple was struck and the sheep scattered. The liars who were the heads of society were responsible for the damage that occurred. It was the apostates who put Christ on the cross. It was the apostates who caused the downfall of the temple. If you look at the history of how come the temple fell. It was apostate Jews fighting with each other. And church is no different. So you see how this applies? The metaphor is so apt. In verse 29, and I haven't gotten to 30 yet. Okay, now, here's the converse. This is the bad news. Alright? This is the bad news. All the bad stuff that happens. Okay, now the good news. Let me get rid of that thing. Now the good news. And the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes will mourn, and these will see the sun coming in the clouds. Okay. This is also at the end of Zechariah's prophecy. Zechariah's. His prophecy in Luke 1. I've already covered that in the Magnificat videos. You're going to have to go look at that. Alright. It's a second advent verse literally. But before that occurs. 
the metaphorical application to church is that when you are going through all of this tribulation because remember we're talking 189 syllables so it's really 284s with a, a 21 somewhere ensconced okay on the negative side you got all these shaking up going on the falling the falling of your luminaries okay but here you are all by yourself. And with all the shaking up going on, you actually want to know God. You actually want to learn the Bible. You actually find out that God's system is that you use 1 John 1, 9. You sit under whomever is your right teacher. And you learn and live on Bible. And you found out from God who that right teacher is. Or you happen to be a teacher. And so he's teaching you. And you're learning and living on Bible. So then what does that mean? That's the Son of Man appearing in the sky to you. I can't see him the way you can see him. You can't see him the way I can see him. But we both see him. And we know we both see him. You can tell when a Christian is actually growing in grace. You can tell when a Christian is actually seeing Christ. If you can see him, then you can tell when somebody else is seeing him. And if you can't see him, then you maybe still can tell when somebody else is seeing him. And then you start wanting to do the same thing. So the converse in verse 30 is that, yeah, okay, we got the sun being dark. These are all outers. Okay, all the outer people, all the outer luminaries, all the outside evidence is bad, 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 bad. Okay, but to the few who actually want him, the appearance of God in your soul, when you're learning and living on Bible, is just as real, if in fact more real, than if he appeared outwardly in the sky. And it's going to go to all the tribes. And don't we mourn when we find out, oh wow, you really do exist. I could have gotten serious about doctrine earlier. Who of us has not mourned that way? And then we see the Son of Man, yeah, we see Him coming, as it were, on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory into our hearts through Bible doctrine. Now, don't get me wrong here. Verse 30 is a literal verse that will actually occur. We will all, all of us will physically see it. The whole world, everybody will see this happening. We will be part of the entourage actually returning to earth that, that will be in the clouds of the sky. Hebrews 12 talks about this verse, talks back to it. It's literal. But it's also metaphorical for the opening and the enlivening of your heart, of the Son of Man appearing in your heart as you learn and live on Bible. Because that's what enables you to see Him in your soul. See Him in your understanding. Because that's the whole purpose of the spiritual life, is to see Him. Not just on the outside. But on the inside, his inside being clear to your inside. So the soul of the Son of Man, inside your soul. I mean, your soul is supposed to be built to be his soul. Line on line, precept on precept. That's how he got built. He became the way, the truth, and the life. So you are also. And you mourn while that's happening. You mourn. And what, what's the morning? This is going to be an actual physical event. You know, all the, everybody standing on earth in Armageddon and elsewhere when he comes back since second advent. They're going to be like, oh, why didn't I believe before? Okay, but you got now. Okay, but when we finally realize how true he is and how real this is, don't we mourn? Don't we look back on our life and say, oh, wow, if only I'd gotten serious sooner. So you see, it has a dual entendre, just like all prophecy does. And this is the application to us now during church. And then the last part, he will send forth a, an angels with a great trumpet and gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. That's actual second advent, where all the Jews who are in diaspora are going to be gathered to Israel. That's the physical, future, tribulational meaning of it at the end of the tribulation. But during church... What's the metaphorical value now? Well, the first metaphorical value now is that he's bringing us all together in Christ. 
I don't necessarily know who my fellow believers are, neither do you. I live in one country, you might live in another. This is not about internationalism. That is, ve that is false. False use of the doctrine. What it is about is that each one of us in our own countries are being gathered within our own countries in order to protect our own countries. The most patriotic thing you can do for your own nation, your home nation, or your host nation is to learn and live on Bible. Use 1 John 1 9 like breathing under your right teacher. That will best protect your own nation. That will provide it with the best prosperity, the best hope, the best freedom, the best everything. And it doesn't matter what kind of government you have. It doesn't matter if you're living under tyranny or living under actual, you know, um, governmental structural freedom. Your soul is always free to learn and live on Bible. They can't, they can't, nobody can hit you there. They can only hit the outside of you. They can't hit the inside of you. So you're always free to learn and live on Bible, and God's going to use whatever circumstances you got to train you in Bible. So that's gathering you. He's gathering the elect from the four winds, and the idea there is that Israel's going to be a client nation to God, preserving the world in the you know um, millennium. Okay, but He's preserving the world through us, salt of the earth now, and you sprinkle salt. You sprinkle a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit in another place. Okay? So we don't know each other, and we aren't all together in one political nation. Chris, political Christianity is Antichrist, Revelation 17, Harlot, equals Ted Cruz Dominionism. It is the antithesis in the Bible. My kingdom is not of this world, Christ said. We are citizens of heaven, not this earth. But we are on earth. And it protects the earth that we are on earth. So he's gathering us together, all right, but not to one political entity. He's still gathering us. It is a geographical will of God for your life. Should you live in one particular town or another? Should you go to one particular store or another? God has a will for every little thing in your life. And the more you know what it is, the more interesting your life becomes. The more enjoyable it becomes okay so that's the part of this thing here the angels gathering together and the trumpet call of God well you hear the trumpet call of God when you know the right Bible doctrine you know this is a physical event that's going to literally happen at the end of the tribulation but there's a metaphorical application of it to you now in church these are the things that I'm trying to explain now because of this structure Verses 29 through 31. You've got 189 syllables in the Greek, which is 284s back to back. And somewhere is God's probably salted, sprinkled amongst all of the syllables is the extra 21. Because I can't find any sub sevens. If you do, let me know. The implication being then there that verses 29 through 31 is also another, a third. A trend of church history where you got the fallen ones in verse 29 constantly getting worse and worse and then you got the ones the ones who are actually learning and living on Bible in verse 30 and then amongst those who are learning and living on Bible he's gathering them in the right geographical place to preserve the world because that was that's the whole you know literal purpose of the verse um, at the second advent so the metaphorical purpose is going to have to be like the literal one. Okay, you got any questions? Let me know. Signing off.